Good morning, and welcome to this week's episode of Ask Dr. Murphy. I hope everyone is doing well today. My name is Katie Berg. I'm a research study coordinator here with the Havey Institute, and I'll be leading today's discussion. I'd like to welcome and introduce Dr. Robert Murphy. Dr. Murphy, how are you this morning? Doing great, thank you. Dr. Murphy is the executive director of the Havey Institute for Global Health, as well as the John Philip Fair Professor of Infectious Diseases here at Northwestern's Feinberg School of Medicine. He answers your COVID, infectious disease, or public health questions each week here on the Havey Institute for Global Health Facebook page. Today, Dr. Murphy will be addressing the latest headlines in U.S. COVID statistics through today, October 19th. We invite you to submit any questions you have down below via Facebook at NU Institute for Global Health or by email at globalhealthinstitute at northwestern.edu. Starting with the COVID statistics in the U.S. from this past week, average new hospitalizations per day were 2,395, average COVID deaths per day were 78.4, and the new vaccine uptake is up to 7 million doses received in the United States. Dr. Murphy, your reactions to those numbers? Yeah, they're stable. Uh, that's a good sign. So down just a little bit, but they're in that that level. There's still a lot of people getting COVID. I got a call to start Paxlovid from somebody just about an hour ago. I mean, it just it's it's just happening everywhere. But you know, most of the people uh, are vaccinated and uh, they're not getting that sick. So that's great. So the hospitalizations are stable, going down, and the deaths per day is stable and down slightly. But the disturbing thing now is that only 7 million people have taken the new vaccine. The old vaccines are helping, but they're like very weak compared to with this virus that's circulating now. The new vaccine is much better. And so the fact that 7 million people have taken the new vaccine, it's been out over a month now, um, it's pretty bad, it's pretty low. I don't know if you remember when the vaccines first came out, you couldn't get a space to get the vaccine. People were driving all over the place to uh, even down to Southern Hill, Carbondale and Quincy, Illinois to get the shots. Um, and, um, you know, this is not the case now. And that's very, very unfortunate because this vaccine actually works so much better. Yes, that is unfortunate news. And transitioning into something you mentioned, we there were some big headlines on research this week regarding Paxlovid and some potential effects going on with that drug. Can you tell us about the discovery and what was reported? Yeah, um, when Paxlovid, uh, the drug that uh, uh, is uh, the number one choice for outpatient treatment, highly effective whether you're vaccinated or not, um, we noted um, that there was rebound. In other words, people would take it, get better, be off the drug, because you only take it for five days, be off the drug, and all of a sudden get COVID again. In other words, that's a rebound. Um, and at first, the companies and the data showed from these big studies that that hardly ever happened. And, you know, it happened to me. It happened to some people I knew, because I start them right away on the Paxlovid. It happened to Dr. Fauci, as a matter of fact. He rebounded. And like, you know, okay, let's look at the data. So what are the data? So um, at a uh, meeting this week in Boston, uh, they looked at a study, 348 patients, um, and um, they enrolled in the study with like right after they got uh, COVID, 116 were treated with Paxlovid and 232 uh, were not treated with Paxlovid or any other kind of treatment. Um, and they collected all the data about the patients uh, uh, and all that stuff. And so rebound was much higher uh, among the patients who were treated with Paxlovid versus those untreated, 32% versus 19. So actually 19%, one in five actually rebounded, but one in three rebounded uh, with the Paxlovid. So what does this, what else happened? Well, in the rebounded patients were twice as likely to have virologic rebound because they followed them the level of virus uh, in the body. Um, so rebound was associated with more virus and more symptoms and whatever. Um, and uh, 
the good news is, is that basically everybody got better at the end of the day anyway, uh, and that's good. Um, and I think it's, uh, uh, the, and then the question remains, what do you, what should you do during the rebound? Uh, I personally took another course of Paxlovid, um, and a lot of other doctors I know always do that. Uh, the, the, at that time, the government controlled all the Paxlovid uh, pretty tightly, and they, right now it's hard to get a second course, but uh, that should really be rethought. Now they should do a study and treat those people. Uh, because they probably uh, would would do better. So, um, you know, uh, the Paxlovid treated patients, of course, had fewer symptoms, lower viral loads altogether, but they had a greater odds of rebounding. Now, also couple in the fact that they also have less COVID, you know, because of the protection uh, of uh, the vaccine was uh, not taken into consideration. But, um, but anyway, um, it was interesting. Yes, it's very interesting. And ID Week, this was a, a very big uh, event. There's a lot of interesting research that was presented at this conference. So we have some more from there. This study is about pediatric vaccination and how it can reduce long COVID in children. Can you tell us a little bit about that study? Well, we people are now studying long COVID very seriously, as we're going to talk about even later. Um, and it's much more common in adults. It's more common in women. We know like the general things. We don't really know how much is out there. It's anywhere from, for, from adults anyway, from seven to 15%, uh, depends on the study that you look at, but you know, it's up there. Children though, uh, in this study anyway, it looked like it was about 3%, um, developed one or more post COVID conditions, which would be long COVID. Now 3% may seems small, but you know, remember this thing is so contagious that translates to 1.9 million children. That's a lot of people. Um, and so um, what happened? So, um, uh, and what's the impact of uh, uh, vaccination? So in the 622 kids um, of the participants, 67% uh, were vaccinated. 5% of the whole population got at least one COVID symptom. In other words, they had long COVID. And the vaccinated group compared to the unvaccinated group, it was a 34% reduction in getting one or more symptoms. In, in other words, in getting long COVID, there was a 48% uh, reduced likelihood of getting two or more symptoms. So like kind of a mild long COVID versus a moderately severe and a 47% reduction of having respiratory long COVID, like chronic chronic uh, lung condition, uh, which of course in, in anybody is bad, but in kids uh, particularly bad. So um, it uh, just uh, another, some harder data on the impact, why you would want to vaccinate a kid. You know, everyone says, oh, the kids don't get sick. The, the kids do get sick. Uh, and 3% of them actually go on to get uh, COVID. Uh, long COVID. So um, it's just another, just more scientific, no more data to, to try to process. And when you're making a decision whether you want to vaccinate your children. Mm -hmm. And speaking of long COVID, like you mentioned, there was a very, very interesting study that was published offering a new explanation for the causation of some long COVID cases. Could you break that down for us? Yeah. Uh, so Long COVID is being studied very seriously. Um, we um, uh, looked, uh, this group uh, looked at uh, another um, uh, factor or potential cause. Uh, we talked about this a couple of uh, weeks or a month ago or so about cortisol levels being decreased. Uh, and in this new study from the University of Pennsylvania, which uh, consisted of 148 patients, um, they found that uh, serotonin, um, which is produced in the gut um, and uh, is associated with um, connected signals between the body and the brain and is associated with decrease in the serotonin, associated with short-term memory uh, problems. So, you know, serotonin you know, is a marker for neurologic things. So anyhow, they found 
uh, in this 148 person thing, uh, for a study, excuse me, that uh, serotonin was the only significant uh, uh, molecule that did, did uh, not recover after acute COVID. So when you have acute COVID, serotonin goes down and then it comes back up close to baseline. But in long COVID, many of those people did not. They also looked at, because serotonin's made it, they, got, they looked at the viral levels in the stool. And they found that in these long COVID cases, there was a, a, a significant reduction uh, in the um, uh, serotonin uh, in the stool. I mean, there was a, a right, a, a, there was serotonin was reduced and the virus was increased in the stool. So if they think that it's the continued viral particles that are in the gut that are causing this long COVID. So that's like a, this mechanistic uh, 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 potential there. Now, <clears throat> the caveats uh, for that study is that it, you know, 148 is not large because that included 58 patients, 58 patients who had long COVID, 30 who didn't, and 60 who were in the early stage of infection. So it's a, it's a very small uh, study, but it um, uh, just tells you that, you know, here's yet another physiologic thing that's happening that may explain long COVID. So, you know, we can't, otherwise we're just saying, I don't know, it happens, you know, but now there's uh, data with cortisol and with serotonin uh, that uh, they may be associated with uh, uh, long COVID. So they can maybe figure out ways to attack that uh, particular mechanism. Absolutely. And of course, we will keep you all up to date on any new or long COVID research that comes out. We know we have interest in that topic, so we will keep you informed. But moving on to our next subject, we've been talking a lot about maternal vaccines and effects that, you know, maternal vaccination, positive effects that could have on the infant. This next study is particularly about the maternal flu vaccine and protection for infants. Could you break that down for us? Yeah, so uh, flu vaccine is recommended for everybody six months and older. Um, and so kids are not, kids under six months are not protected. All right. So pregnant women typically are strongly encouraged to take the flu vaccine to not only protect themselves while they're pregnant, but also those antibodies that the mother produces from the vaccine typically protect the, uh, the baby as well in the first few months of life. And so they found that maternal vaccination in this study uh, and plus any exposure to human milk, breast milk, was associated with a 56 uh, lower likelihood of infection in infants. It's basically like you're giving them the vaccine as well. In a way you are because you know the, the baby is in, in the body. Um, so while, uh, you know, so that's great to have less flu because flu, you know, can be very damaging. And while deaths from influenza in infants are rare, uh, it still is a major cause of what we call morbidity and mortality. In other words, you get sick, you can end up in the hospital. Uh, I mean, it, it's very scary when a kid uh, ends up in a hospital or an ICU for whatever the reason is. But uh, the data really show that these maternal vaccinations, particularly when it's given in, given in the second semester, uh, second trimester, uh, is very effective. In the, if the mother takes it in the, the, the middle of the pregnancy, the second trimester, uh, the reduction in influenza-like illness is reduced by 79%. That's huge. Um, and if they she takes it in the first trimester, the reduction is only 39%. Uh, but still, I mean, it's it's okay. I mean, it's okay to, it's going to help no matter where you give it, but it, it, this is very nice data so that second trimester uh, may really be the best. Yes, and of course, keep looking out for those flu shots, COVID shots, RSV shots, if you're eligible. Like we said, they are available and we're not seeing that much uptake, which is not a great sign. Well, so, I, I failed to mention, this is a huge study. It's 44,000 mother-infant pairs. I mean, this is gigantic, you know, so um, it's a very strong data. Absolutely. Very, very strong with such a large sample size. Our final story for today is a short one, but a little bit of a public announcement for those of us in Cook County. The Illinois Department of Public Health reported a 
very significant case recently. Could you please tell us about what that was? Another case of measles has popped up here in Cook County. Um, we haven't had one since 2019, so it's been four years uh, since we had a measles case. And of course, the person was an unvaccinated in uh, individual who had been traveling internationally. So the vaccine, you know, depending on what country you go to, you know, the vaccine uptake uh, for measles, uh, you know, varies. And so when you travel, especially if you're going to a, a low or middle income country, you know, where the vaccine coverage is not that good, you can get mumps, measles, you can get, you know, all sorts of stuff that people just don't see very much here in the United States. Remember that measles highly contagious. It's uh, that and COVID are the two most infectious diseases uh, known to man uh, that cause a serious illness. So, um, you know, uh, the, uh, uh, so if, if you think you have measles, this would be most likely, and you are not vaccinated, all right? Uh, because the vaccine works so well. But if you are not vaccinated and you get a rash, high fever, cough, runny nose, red watery eyes, um, seven to 21 days after exposure to someone that has it, if you, if you even know that, um, you need to contact your healthcare provider before you go into a medical office or an emergency room or urgent care because it's so contagious, uh, especially at that stage. So contact them, you know, so I'm at risk for measles. I got these symptoms, what should I do? And they will tell you what to do uh, because you don't want to infect uh, any uh, anybody else. Highly, highly contagious. So measles, okay, rash and, you know, runny nose, sore throat, whatever, you know, that doesn't sound too bad. And most people do recover very nicely. However, it can, you can get pneumonia and you can get encephalitis, a swelling around the brain. And in less than 1%, you can die uh, from the encephalitis or the pneumonia. So uh, people can get very, very sick uh, from measles. And before the measles vaccine was developed, there were a lot of very sick kids and, and people did die uh, on a fairly regular basis from, uh, from measles. So um, just be careful if you think you have it. Definitely contact your healthcare provider or the public health department in your uh, area uh, to ask them um, how you should handle that. Absolutely. And we're hoping everyone out there stays safe and healthy. Dr. Murphy, I'd like to thank you both for your time and expertise. It's much appreciated as always. Great. Thank you. And thank you everyone for joining us this week for the Ask Dr. Murphy series. We enjoy having you back week after week. If you have any questions you'd like to submit for Dr. Murphy, please feel free to do so in the comments below or at any of our social medias li linked in the description. Thank you and have a great one.